that uh, Chazal are also very, some of them, critical of our forefathers, and even more far-reaching than I would dare to say. And then uh, there come these uh, uh, Ishmaelim uh, traders on camels, and uh, Yehuda, who is another Bechor, and they are competing, you know, Ruben and Yehuda, he's always more uh, sophisticated than Ruben, and he says, uh, there is no real profit from uh, letting him die. And the indirect murder is, there, is not uh, very different than direct murder. Let us sell him to Egypt, behind the Iron Curtain. Nobody returns from Egypt, if, especially if you are a slave there. So let us sell him to them, and it's, uh, we are uh, more uh, human, and we don't shed the, uh, his blood, and we reach the same consequences. And I think, and they agree, and I believe that they're very, very happy that there was found that this Bechor, Yehuda, found a solution to uh, forestall the dreams without murder. What I forgot to mention is that, uh, so they said, for 20 shekels, and 20 shekel, we know it from archaeology, was the price of a slave in those days. Which means they, they were not ashamed to take, or perhaps they wanted to camouflage that it is his brother, so they sold them in a real uh, uh, transaction. And then Ruben comes to the pit and sees that the pit is empty. He says, the child has vanished. And where shall I go from here? What shall I do? Which shows, and he rents his garments. So we see that this is very important that in biblical stories, there, are, there is a symbolic language which we have to discover. And one of the element, one of the components of this language is in the story of Yosef is garments, just like the uh, in Megillat Esther. Megillat Esther is a, is a mirror of the Joseph story. So if I would have been invited before Purim, I would show you some 20 parallels. It's really built according to the story of Joseph. So. Uh, in, the, in both stories, garments are very, very important. So the first uh, thing is that the tunic means birthright. Now he is stripped of his tunic, and it is dipped into blood of a kid which they slaughter, and they don't dare to, sh to bring this to their father in person. They send a messenger. But in this most, the most cruel statement, perhaps in the book of Breshit, you say, Hakerna Hakdonet bin Chai im lo. You, you bought this tunic, didn't you? We have only a suspicion that it is, uh, of, uh, belongs to Joseph, but you can really identify it. So we brought it to you, no? You know, you can imagine with the blood, with the uh, dried out blood. <coughs> And Yaakov recognizes the tunic and says, Ktonet bini, Tarof Toraf Yosef, Chaya Ra'a Achalatu. It is truly the tunic of my son. He was uh, killed by a bad animal. You can make a midrash very easily. You know who this animal is, or animals rather. Uh, and he says, I will not recover from this uh, trauma. I will go after him to the land of the dead. Avel Sheola, I will go mourning. I won't have a happy day in my life. This is what Yaakov said. And I believe this is not written explicitly that here starts the tshuva of his children. They did not believe that he will be so sad. 
or they didn't think so far. They wanted to get rid of Yosef, but now they see the consequences. By Akumul and Achamol, they try to, uh, how do you say, to comfort him, and they don't succeed. You know, we, we do something very quickly, but we don't see the consequences. They were blind too, and now they have to open their eyes to the outcome of what they did. Uh, and Yosef is brought to Egypt and uh, sold to uh, a very prominent uh, uh, chief, and I would say Saul, minister in the court of Tao. We succeeded in uh, ending chapter 37. And now we will skip chapter 38, which is the story of Yehuda Betamar, which, so to speak, does not fit our story. It takes 20 years. <laughs> the story inside, the, the plot needs 20 years to uncover, to unroll, and it's surely not uh, parallel in time to what happened to Joseph. But Many scholars from Chazal till uh, Uri Alter, Robert Alter, uh, show there are very many parallels between the stories, but I have not have not even one moment to, to speak about it. So we continue chapter 38. Excuse me? 39. Oh, thank you. It's very intricate to see the parallels, and uh, but we really cannot do it. So he comes to Egypt, he stands there in the slave market, he's picked up by a very rich person, and now something uh, which we did not expect happens, but Yaakov expected it. This boy is highly, highly talented. Extremely talented. In, in brackets, I, I tell you, he deserves to be the Bechor. He really deserves to be. Now there's no favorism. He is in a foreign country. He's just by his merits. And God is with him. Everything he touches is a success. And very, very quickly, he's nominated the second in charge in the house of Potiphar. Simply unbelievable. Perhaps for Joseph this was natural, because he believed in his abilities. But the reader is very much surprised. He's not only not broken by what happened to him, he thrives there. <laughs> and now we have the, uh, the, the small story about the seduction of Yosef by uh, the wife of Potiphar, which is the first story about uh, harassment, sexual harassment in the Bible, <laughs> by women, by a woman. See, life is more complicated than we think. Everything is written in the Bible. This is rule number one. Secondly, the Bible is as rich as life. And uh, here this uh, is a woman in charge of him, and she thinks that she can exploit him sexually. And it says so he, that he was a fetor, the same word which are said about Rachel, his mother, that is extremely beautiful. And he is a lonely stranger in the country, and she thinks that uh, she can seduce him. And he says, no, I can't do it to my master, I can't do it to my God. I simply cannot do it. He trusts me. He gave me everything at all in, in my charge except you. And I cannot betray him. And in addition, God sees what I'm doing in, uh, in every chamber. And I can't do it. But she does not accept no as an answer. And one day, when they are all here alone, all people are busy outside, she uh, tries to take hold of him. And she 
grabs his garment and he flees and believe it or not, he is stripped again from his tunic. This is a tunic of prominence. He doesn't go around like a simple slave. This is a tunic which will indict him. Indict him. Indict him. In a few hours. This it doesn't it's not called ketonet pasim, but we, we read uh, with open eyes and we understand that it happens to him for the second time. And she is not uh, hesitant to excuse him for uh, trying to rape her and says, here, he brought his garment, he laid it on. We have another picture of, of Rembrandt showing the garment <laughs> spread on a bed and she's showing this as a, a proof for his bad intentions. This stranger tried to rape me. And we readers close the book. We can't take it. We ask ourselves, in Egypt the same thing happens to him that happened in Dotan. But in Dotan, he was responsible, if not guilty, for the aggressiveness of his brothers. He was at least partially guilty. Why didn't he change his garments? And he was thrown into the pit. Here in Egypt, he is Yosef HaTzadik. This is how Chazal call him. He's a tzadik who does not do the wrong thing because he has a conscience and he has obligations. And he is fearing God. And he is stripped again. And the Torah calls the prison a pit, which makes clear the analogy Joseph in his life, you know, he goes from pit to pit. <laughs> and you close the book and you ask yourself, does he deserve it? For surely not. So why that God, the God of providence, bring this upon yourself, right? We cannot continue. You should not. If you have such questions, you should not continue. Open them and Tashim, try to answer. Old and modern, try to find an answer. <coughs> For sure, God is testing yourself. <coughs> and the fact that he did a good thing does not mean that he is rewarded immediately. This is not how it is in life, you know. I, I fasted at Yom Kippur, uh, immediately I become healthy of my ulcers, or what? How do you say? No, it's not so quick. But this is more important than this. In, in, in Dotan, Yosef learned responsibility for his action and for his behavior. In Egypt, he has to have another lesson. Whether he believes truly in his dreams, does he really believe that this pit, the second pit, is not the final station? He's really destined to greatness? This is a second testing, a different testing, an opposite test. But you, we, we, we realize that God is educating Joseph so finally he will be able to educate his brothers because he is the great educator. The more than he is Yosef HaTzadik, he is Yosef HaMachanech, the Yosef the educator. The person who is able not only to save Egypt and his family, that person who is able to change his brothers for the good. So uh, he's in the pit. But you are already accustomed to the talents of Joseph. You are not surprised. Immediately, he is recognized as being so talented that uh, the master, the person in charge of the prison, uh, makes him a second in, in, in command. It's when I read the, uh, the story of Joseph and in uh, my parents' home, there were not many books for children. Oh, there were thousands of them in German, in Gothic script, but for children, they were very... So one day I was sick and I, my father left and said I have to 
go. I said, what should I do? He said, read. I said, uh, what should I